Seven simple likable concepts to drive results for you in your life and in your business. If you have a business first, listen first and never stop listening. Second, develop a signature style. Third, tell, don't sell. Fourth, reach the right people. Fifth, be valuable. Be fantastic. And finally, be grateful. Let's talk first about listening. Ernest Hemingway said, when people talk, listen completely. Most people never listen. And this to me is one of the biggest truisms out there. Everyone thinks they're a good listener, but most people really aren't very good at listening. Most people aren't really listening. They're waiting to talk. And there's a huge difference. If you're listening, you are 100% focused on the person or people that are in front of you. The way I like to think about it is, I don't know how many of you guys have kids, huh? but if you have kids and they're ever watching TV and they're like totally focused on the TV, like you could go like this in front of their face and they would, they would keep staring right at that screen. Or now I guess it's, in many cases, iPad or iPhone. It's the same thing with listening. If you're truly listening, then nothing can phase you. Nothing can interrupt you. You are exclusively focused on that person that you're listening to. Or um, thanks to the amazing world of social media, if, 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 if you're a business person, you can now listen at great scale. You can listen to literally thousands of people uh, that are talking about uh, you or your business or your competitors or have a need that you can help solve. I like to think of social media as a 24-7, 365 focus group. And most people think about social media for the talking parts, but I, I first think about social media for the listening parts. And I'm, I want to tell you a quick story about a trip I had to Vegas that changed the way I thought about social media and Twitter forever. And I know this is a very sophisticated audience, so you probably all appreciate the business value of listening and the business value of Twitter. But I'll bet you, you know at least one person, one executive out there that doesn't yet fully appreciate the business value of Twitter or the business value of listening. And for those people, I want to share this. Several years ago, I had taken a flight from New York to Vegas. And after a six hour flight, I just wanted to get some rest, check into my hotel room. I was staying at the trendiest hotel in uh, Vegas at the time, the Aria. And I was waiting online to check in for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Eventually I was waiting online over 45 minutes. So of course I did what any social media nerd would do. I took out my phone and I tweeted, waiting online over 45 minutes at the Aria, not worth it, hashtag fail. Now, the ARIA wasn't listening, and the ARIA never responded to my tweet, but I'll tell you, right down the street, the Rio was listening, and the Rio responded to my tweet, and the competitive hotel, they responded to my tweet within 60 seconds. Now, every time I tell this story to senior executives all over the world, their eyes light up, their faces light up. This is the moment they think, wow, I got it, I figured it out, the ROI the return on, your, on investment in social media. What did they tweet back? Come on over, we'll take better care of you, Dave. Come on over, we have a room with your name on it. And some of you are thinking that right now. But if they had written that, that, I would have thought two things. First, it's kind of creepy that they're going after me this aggressively. And second, why is it wide open at the Rio when it's so jam-packed and happening and crowded at the Aria? Instead, what they tweeted back was the following. Sorry you're having a bad experience, Dave. Hope the rest of your time in Vegas goes well. Sorry you're having a bad experience, Dave. Hope the rest of your time in Vegas goes well. Well, guess where I stayed the next time I went to Vegas and the time after that and the time after that. So simply by listening and demonstrating empathy, they were able to win my business for many years to come. And they have generated thousands and thousands of dollars worth of revenue from that one single tweet. And none of us on this call could say that was a sales tweet or a marketing tweet. Literally all they were doing was listening and demonstrating empathy. People are talking, all you need to do is listen. Now here's an example. If you're a consultant or a coach that works with small businesses, do a Twitter search for Grow My Business, and you can find people right now that you can listen to and potentially help. And once you do join the conversation, social media allows you to develop a unique brand voice and have a lot of fun with it. So uh, this is a slide that I love from Stephanie Schwab that talks about the various aspects of what your social media voice can look like and what you're doing out there. And here's an example of a business that I love. The Cumberland Farms uh, is a convenience store in New England. And they have a product called the Chill Zone, which is really popular with teenagers and not anyone else. <laughs> so when Ben Silver posts on the Cumberland Farms Chill Zone Facebook page, sometimes I just lay under the faucet and chug Chill Zone until I pass out. The Chill Zone, even though they're owned by a very, very large company, responds, ha, 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 what a baller. 
Now that doesn't mean that every professional out there right now, if you're an accountant or an attorney, that you should start talking like this on social media. But what it does mean is you have an opportunity to bring some humanity, to bring some personality, to bring some fun to your voice as you do explore Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and, and Snapchat and all these social networks. Let's talk about developing a signature style. Rachel Zoe said, style is a way to say who you are without having to speak. And for me, it's been, a, it's been an amazing blessing. You know, I grew up a total nerd with no fashion sense and no style. And I'm still a total nerd with no fashion sense. But now, years, years and years later, I have a signature style that has been very, very helpful and beneficial in my life. I want you to meet Dave McClure. He's the guy on the uh, bottom left here. And Dave uh, was a longtime uh, venture capitalist with a, a firm called 500 Startups. So several years ago, when I was raising money for Likeable Local, I had to uh, meet with all these investors and find people that would give me money. And it was really hard. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. Uh, and I ended up raising a whole bunch of money, but it was really, really difficult tracking uh, these investors down. And Dave was no different. Uh, I remember getting an introduction to him via a warm uh, mutual uh, connection, which by the way, anytime you want to build an introduction with someone, mutual connections is the way to go. Warm introductions is the absolute way to go to meet people. But anyway, I got an introduction through our mutual friend, Victoria, and via email, and, and I got an auto, automatic email back from Dave saying, sorry, I don't respond to emails. If you're creative, you'll figure out a way to get a hold of me. So I was like, wow, what am I going to do? Well, then I saw Dave was speaking at an entrepreneurship conference in New York where I live. So I bought a ticket for over $1,000, but I bought a ticket, I invested, I figured I'd learn a thing or two, and more important, I'd get to meet Dave and pitch Dave on my new company. Well, unfortunately for me, there was over a thousand other entrepreneurs that had the same idea with respect to pitching the handful of VCs that were in the building that day. And the whole day went by, and every time I had an opportunity to meet Dave, well, I just was in a line full of over 50 people and I, I never got the chance to meet him. So I, I had a really rough day and it was 5.30 and I was actually waiting uh, at, online for cocktail to kind of drink away my sorrows from wasting all that time and money. And all of a sudden I hear, I need to meet the man that's wearing those mother effing shoes. And there was Dave in the room full of thousands almost over a thousand people that were trying to track this guy down. He actually sought me out and sought a conversation with me out because of my bright orange shoes. Well, of course, in the conversation, I ended up telling him about our company and he introduced me to one of his New York associates. And several weeks later, they invested $500,000 in Likeable Local. Now, I'm not here to tell you that if you wear orange shoes, you'll get $500,000 from you know, an investor necessarily. But what I am here to say is that developing a signature style is really, really valuable. And whether it's the color of your shoes or a necklace or earrings or a hairstyle or a hat or a tie or a handkerchief or a purse or a belt, there are lots and lots of options for you to develop a signature style that makes you memorable and helps you stand out in a sea full of people that you can find in really every major city in the world. And I now have over 51 pairs of orange shoes. I wear a different pair of orange shoes or sneakers every single day. And I'll tell you, it, it's an amazing experience because not a day goes by when somebody doesn't walk up to me and say, wow, I love your shoes. My favorite color is orange, great shoes. And what this does is it opens up lots more opportunities for me to meet people. It's actually a gift if you are introverted or for other introverted people because it gives them a conversation topic by having a standout signature style. So. Maybe orange shoes are probably not for everyone, but I, I'm going to challenge you guys to think of what your signature style might be. Let's talk about storytelling. Robert McKee said, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. Today, I would argue it's always been the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. People love a good story. How many of you guys love to, like to be sold to? Nobody. How many of you guys love a good story? Everyone. So if you are involved in sales and really, if you're technically involved in sales or not, you're involved in sales. Every time you want to convince somebody to do something, convince somebody of an idea, convince somebody to go out with you, whatever it is, you are in sales. Every time you, you, you think about sales, think, think a little bit more about how you can tell a great story versus sell. I'll tell you a little bit about 
uh, how our first business came to came to be. Uh, my wife and I were dating and we were getting very serious and we, we decided we wanted to get married, but we couldn't afford the large wedding that we wanted. I wanted to be able to invite literally everyone I ever met to my wedding. And we luckily had a great marketing background. So we ended up with an idea and we partnered with, uh, with a minor league baseball team and created a promotion called Our Field of Dreams and decided we would get married at the end of the baseball game. Fans could stay to watch the game and we would sell sponsorships. And we ended up doing just that. We sold over $100,000 in sponsorships. 1-800-Flowers.com sponsored our flowers. David's Bridal sponsored our bridesmaids gowns. Entenmann sponsored our desserts. Smirnoff sponsored our alcohol. And we raised $20,000 for an amazing charity. Got married in front of 5,000 fans and uh, 500 friends and family. And at the end of the uh, wedding, they got so much press. Every major network in the world was there. Newspapers, New York Times, blogs. Our vendor said, this was great. What are you guys gonna do next? We couldn't get married again, so we started a business instead. And that's 11 years ago, I, I, but I still tell that story because it brings to life our creativity and innovation in a way that really resonates with people. The only thing better than telling your story is inspiring others to tell your story for you. Who can you get to tell your story for you? Take a look at the I Love Mary at McDonald's in Chandler, Arizona page. This is a, a Facebook page dedicated to this employee that works at the McDonald's in Chandler, Arizona. Whether you like McDonald's or not, no one can argue about how powerful and amazing this Facebook page is. Right, this is a multinational, multi-billion dollar company with some free advertising. And not only are there 1,400 people in the I Love Mary McDonald's in Chandler, Arizona Facebook page, but even cooler than that, some of the comments. I haven't seen Mary lately. Where has she been? Happy People Day, Mary. We love you in the Rocky Mountain region. And Mary is the best. This is the picture of us at my 40th birthday party on Saturday night. So two questions for you. One, who or what's your Mary? What's, what's the aspect of your business or your life or your personality that's truly worth talking about? What's the most special thing that you've got going for you? So the McDonald's of Chandler, Arizona, it's clearly this woman named Mary. And second, who's your Delin Lucas Bach? Who are your customers or friends or associates that are gonna help to tell your story to the rest of the world? Five stories you can tell your humble beginnings, clients that have overcome obstacles thanks to you, employee challenges inside the lives of your leadership, community and charity partnerships that you may, you, you may have. And how can you tell your story? Blogs, videos, Instagram, uh, infographics. There are so many ways to tell your story in today's world. Now, who are you gonna tell your story to? How are you gonna grow? How are you gonna build, build something? There's a movie called The Social Network. Many of you have seen that and there's a line of The Social Network. You know what's cooler than a million dollars? A billion dollars. Well, my line's kind of the opposite. You know what's cooler than reaching a billion people? Reaching the right thousand or the right hundred or the right 10 or maybe even the right one with the right message to make a difference. Facebook and LinkedIn have these amazing features where now you can truly hyper-target and even nano-target to reach the right people. Let me give you an example. I took out an ad targeting 34-year-old female graduates of Emerson College that work at Likeable Media and uh, are married and live in the zip code 11050. Of the billion people on the planet, that were on Facebook at the time, only one person saw that ad. Now, I know it's kind of, uh, what's the point of, okay, you can target your wife. Well, what's the point unless you want to target your husband or wife on Facebook? The point is you can reach the right people. So if you want to reach uh, for your business, a CFOs in your town, you can reach just CFOs in your town. If you want to reach for to get a job, you want to reach the, the uh, CEO of a particular company in your town or the purchasing manager or the real estate developer, whoever it is, you can reach this right people using Facebook and LinkedIn. And this has never, ever before been possible. Be valuable. When you think about how you can create value for others instead of what you can get for others, it makes an enormous difference. So I lead in all my relationships with how can I be valuable for you? Uh, Einstein said, try not to become a man of success, but rather to become a man of value. And in trying to become a man of value, of course, Einstein became very, very successful. And it's awkward when you first meet, meet new people. 
But let me tell you about Michael Kisling. Michael was one of literally hundreds of, of, of people that solicit me uh, every day. Uh, the biggest categories uh, that I get of solicitors are real estate, uh, real estate folks and financial planners. And I understand, I get it, that it's part of their business is, is, is reaching out to new people. Um, but it, it, it's difficult to sort through, you know, literally dozens of these uh, solicitations every week. Well, Michael's solicitation was a little different. He wrote, you know, Dave, I'd love 15 minutes of your time and I promise I won't try to sell you and I have just one question for you. It really got my attention. I, I thought, all right, I'm gonna give you a shot. You got your shot. 15 minutes, come on in, what's your question? And um, he came to my office and he said, all right, well, would love to know what you're up to just really quickly before I ask you the question. I said, well, you know, I've got a couple businesses here, like the media, like the local, I'm raising some money for like the local right now. That's probably my biggest challenge. And he said, okay, great. Well, my one question for you, and today I have learned these are the five most powerful words in any meeting or in any uh, interaction with somebody new. How can I help you? How can I help you, he said. And then to take it a step further, because sometimes how can I help you can be almost too broad a question. He said, for instance, for instance, how I often help people in your situation is I, I make introductions and I, I know you're raising money for like a local, perhaps I can introduce you to a VC or two. And I said, yeah, venture capitalist, I'll take an intro, thanks so much. He said, no problem, I'll take care of it. And there was a few minutes left in the 15 minutes, so I said, well, you have a few minutes left, why don't you give me your spiel, tell me a little bit about what you do. I said, I said you know, you, you made it, came all this way. He said, absolutely not, I promised you no selling, I'm not here to sell you, I was truly just here to see how, how I could help you, I'll make those intros, no worries. What happened, he made the intro to the VC, and several months later, I had a chunk of money that I wanted to put away, and I, I called him up. I said, you know, you, you didn't try to sell me. You were there to provide value, and now I, I'm soliciting you to be my financial planner. Can I hire you? And I hired him, and I've referred him to several people since, and it's been a wonderful relationship. And that relationship didn't start by him trying to sell me. It started by him trying to help me. And my challenge to you all, there are a lot of people that I say this to and they're like, well, how can I help everyone? I mean, I'm just me. First of all, try to get that word just out of your vocabulary because there's no good thing about the word just at all. Horrible word. Minimizing, it's not a good word. Next, always think about what your unique value is. For example, I often speak to college students and I'll say to college students, how many of you guys know how to use Snapchat? And they'll all raise their hand because we're all addicted to Snapchat. And then I'll say, well, let's say you wanted to meet a Fortune 500 CEO. I'll bet you anything you could send that Fortune 500 CEO a LinkedIn message or an email saying, hi, my name is Johnny. And I'd love 15 minutes of your time because I want to teach you how to use Snapchat. Because Snapchat represents a total communications shift in the world. And it's totally different from anything that people have ever seen before. If I'm a Fortune 500 CEO and I'm clueless about Snapchat, which most of them are, I'd probably take that meeting with that college kid. Every single person out there has value to give and every single person out there has ways that they can learn. People ask you how you're doing. You say, I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm busy. I'm tired. I'm going to challenge you. If you take one thing from me today, take this. Next time somebody asks you how you're doing, say, fantastic. I'm fantastic. Let's look at the science behind that. See, we actually all have, well, Dale Carnegie first said, enthusiasm is contagious and so is the lack of it. We all have mirror neurons. Mirror neurons inside our brain that actually mirror the attitude of the person that we're speaking with. So when, when you're having a great day, when you're excited about life, when you're feeling good, you impact others in a positive way. And similarly, when you're having a crappy day, when somebody asks you, how you doing? You say, ah, shitty. That also actually has a physiological impact on the person that you're talking to. So when you want something, when you're going into a meeting, when you're going into a pitch, when you're going into a job interview, if you want to get what, what you want out of the other person, you absolutely have to be as fantastic as possible. And it will impact your results. Now, people say, Dave, what if I'm not feeling fantastic already? What if I'm having a lousy day? Well, am I lying? Well, no. First of all, 
let's, let's, let's get some perspective here. Even on your worst day, you are probably better off than 99% of the entire planet, right? The reality is if you're on this webinar, if you have a computer, if you live in America, you are already better off than 99% of the people on this planet. Well, let's shift your perspective. perspective. But let's say you're still, uh, fine, I get that, Dave, but it's hard to actually feel that way if you're having a lousy day. I'll tell you a story. Uh, I was traveling to DC for a big uh, pitch. And I found out in the morning that I just lost a $500,000 client. I was really upset about that. I mean, obviously. And then the trainer was running late and I hadn't eaten anything. And I was kind of tired and hungry and, and upset. And I thought, all right, I'm going to cure my bad mood with the best way I know how food. And I looked up the best sushi restaurant in Washington, DC. And it was over a mile walk, but I thought, you know what, I should get a little exercise. So even though it's a little warm, I'm gonna walk to the restaurant. So I walked a mile, sweating a little bit, which was not good, but fine. Walked a mile to the restaurant. And I finally get to the restaurant that was voted number one sushi restaurant in Washington, DC. What do I see? Closed for renovations. So at this point, I'm really, really bummed. I'm like, this is just a, a, a mess. This is a mess. I'm walking to the meeting, to the, to the big pitch that I've got, and I see a homeless guy. And normally I don't give to homeless people on the streets at this, at this point in my life because I'd, I'd rather support specific organizations. But I, I had a moment, so I reached into my pocket to get some change, and he saw me, and so he comes over. And of course, I can't find any change. So now I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm at that point where like, oh, shoot, now he really thinks I'm a jerk. So I'll, I'll give him a buck. So I reach into my wallet now to take, give him a, a dollar bill. And of course, I don't have any single signals. All I've got is a 50. So now again, I have a choice. I can look like a total jerk or I can spend 50 bucks, which I certainly wasn't planning on doing. Well, I just, for some reason, I decided on the ladder. I hand him a $50 bill. And you would have thought that he won the lottery, the mega millions, freaking out, jumping up and down, thank you so much, asking if he could hug me, telling me this was the most, you know, the most awesome thing to happen to him like all year. $50 for me, which in the grand scheme of things is really not that much, ended up not only helping him and putting him in a great place, but completely changing my mood, completely changing my mindset, completely changing everything for me. And I went to that meeting and I had a wonderful meeting. So my two simple hacks to put yourself in a fantastic mood are one, simple acts of kindness, you're feeling down, go give a dollar to a homeless person. Go hold the door for the next 10 people to walk into your office building. Sometimes if I'm really feeling down and I really need to pick me up, I'll call my mom, a true act of kindness. And then the other thing to do to lift your spirits anytime is my favorite drug on the planet. And this is a drug that uh, I, am, I am just constantly blown away with how powerful it is and how few the side effects are. And that, that drug is called gratitude. G.K. Chesterton said that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I have witnessed the unbelievable transformation of many, many people, including myself, from ritualistic daily acts of gratitude. Uh, my friends over at Jonas Chews actually did a, a study on handwritten thank you cards, and they compared the effects of writing handwritten thank you cards to email thank yous found that those people that got handwritten thank you cards were 38% more likely to donate again to Donors Choose. By the way, wonderful, wonderful nonprofit. Check out DonorsChoose.org if you haven't. And they actually gave more when they, when, they, uh, when they gave again. So I began a practice of daily handwritten thank you cards. We also have a practice at dinner where every day we go around the table and everyone says one person that they're thankful for in the family, one person that they're thankful for outside of the family. And when I'm really feeling down and I need a huge pick me up, I will do a gratitude list competition where I will set my timer at two minutes and open up my phone and write as many people and things that I'm grateful for in two minutes as I possibly can. And in just two minutes, totally transforms my mood, puts me in a better place. And once I'm fantastic, I can take on the world. So quick, quick recap for you guys. And then I will take your questions. And I don't know how many people are live tweeting. I haven't checked yet, but per my, per my note before, the first 10 people to tweet with LeadX at me are going to win books, your choice of likable social media, 
likable business, art of people, and work it by my wife, Karen Kirkman. So first, listen first and never stop listening. You can actually measure your listening versus talking ratio. Use a stopwatch to measure in a conversation or in a meeting how much you listen versus how much you talk in order to help improve that ratio. Develop a signature style. What's your version of orange shoes? Who or what is your Mary from McDonald's? What is the aspect of your business or personality that is truly worth talking about? Who do you want to reach? What's your version of hyper-targeting from my Facebook ad to my wife? And how can you reach them creatively? How can you put those five magic words to use? How can I help you? How can you get yourself in the right mindset to be fantastic and have that enthusiasm be contagious for the people around you? And finally, how can you pick up what I truly believe is the world's greatest addiction and add gratitude to your tool set of influence? I'll close with a quote and then I'll take your questions. Uh, from Seth Godin, how dare you settle for less when the world has made it so easy to be remarkable? None of the things that I talked about today are rocket science, and yet they all allow you to influence others, build your brand, and build your business in very, very simple ways. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned before, here are a bunch of books that I've written, and uh, your choice of any of these three books or Work It. Uh, if you are tweeting along and one of the first 10 people to tweet with the hashtag lead X, if you want to get a hold of me today, tomorrow for the rest of your life, one of my core values is responsiveness. So if you tweet at me or you email me or you message me on LinkedIn, I would be thrilled to answer any of your questions uh, for the rest of your life. And uh, one other uh, gift for my good friends at lead X and, and, and lead X's followers. Um, one way that I think I can help you is by sharing your articles with my LinkedIn following. I have a very nice following of about 650,000 people. And if you send me an article to a blog post that you've written or a charity you're supporting, I will share one article from each of you with my 650,000 followers. Just message me the link via LinkedIn.